Good afternoon everybody and welcome to a, another installment of our kids drive on a Saturday afternoon here in sunny South Africa. As you can see we've got some kudu that have joined us for the start of the day. My name is Tristan on camera I've got Craig this afternoon and it is a very warm welcome to all of you. Now I hope that you're going to have the best time as you follow us around for the next hour and we explore South Africa's best treasures here in the Savi Sand Game Reserve. Now remember while we are driving around that you can talk to us and so you're going to need to ask your parents to send through any questions that you have and they can send it through to Nacho kids at wildearth.tv and it's important that you ask your parents or your older siblings to do so now what we've got at the moment there's a whole bunch of kudu that are just sitting and taking it very easy. Most of them are positioned themselves in a little bit of shade because it's quite a warm afternoon today. We've had some bad weather the last few days and it's meant that the animals have been able to move around all over the place. But today the sun has come out and we're back into our springtime and so it feels nice and warm. And basically these kudu, because it's quite hot and they're covered in fur, they need to find themselves some shade. And so when they do find themselves some shade during the hot part of the day, what they'll end up doing is often just ruminating or just feeding very close to where they're standing and the reason why they do this is because walking around and kind of moving and trying to find food in this heat will cause their body temperature to go up quite a bit and so instead if they just sit still where there's a bit of shade they can then have a very special technique where they regurgitate of food that they put into their mouth and then they chew it and that's called ruminating so it is a quite a special thing that they do right now I'm not the only one out here my friend Taylor is with me and she's found a feathered friend and wants to say hello we have found a feathered friend who would like to say hello this afternoon and it is a bird called a hornbill now that is a red-billed hornbill I'm not a red-billed hornbill well, my name is Taylor and I am a human and David is also on camera with us and he's also a human. Now, it's great to have all of you kids watching us today and I hope that you're ready to, well, ask us some questions. So remember to ask your parents who will do all the typing for you and they'll send them on through. So, look at this bird. It's pecking in the poop. And the reason why it's doing that is because it's looking for something to eat. Now, that is rhinoceros poop actually. Which is quite cool because you don't get to see rhinos very often and I don't know what's in there There could be little beetles. There could be some flies. There could be termites Looks like there's lots of flies buzzing around its head. So it's trying to eat all the little insects that have gone into that dung So that they can feed so There's lots of animals out here that like to eat poop especially the insects and this great stuff because it's not really all digested you see that you can see some bits and pieces of grass still so this kind of says to me that this it was a white rhino that was here oh it ran off to find something else what else have we got there see how it uses its long beak to spread open all the dung and then i love the way when it finds something that they throw their heads back and then open their beaks and catch it in their mouth i don't know how many of you have ever tried to throw a skittle or a raisin or something up into the air and catch it in your mouth I'm not very good at it and I used to try and practice when I was little still not very good and these birds do it so easily I'm jealous so there's even some little beetles called dung beetles but I haven't been seeing too many of them at this time of the year I think all the insects as we get to the end of spring will start to come out because hopefully we'll have a little bit of rain now it seems as though we're going to be looking at a lot of different birds today here in South Africa. Tristan has got one of the coolest birds in Africa. We do have one of the coolest birds on our kudu, so our kudus are still sitting still, but you might find every now and then there's a little bit of movement on the kudu, and that's a type of bird that often is on the animals. It's called a red-billed oxpecker, and oxpeckers are incredibly important for the kudu because they help to manage the parasites that the kudu has. So things like ticks that get onto this kudu, these little oxpeckers will bound up and down, and they'll be able to grab on those kind of ticks and feed off them, and they keep the kudu's coat nice and clean. They'll also get little parasites out of the ears, around the noses, and so it really is a helpful little bird to have around. And you can see that's why the kudu is pretty tolerant of them. If it was something that hurt the kudu, you would find the kudu would not just sit still. It would try and move around and kind of shake them off. Every now and then if they get too close to the eyes, you'll find the kudu 
cuckoo will shake its head but otherwise it's quite happy for these oxpeckers just to go up and down and clean them off at the end of the day they need to stay nice and clean and so if they've got a bird that does it for them well that's very very helpful now what's interesting is that particular kudu you can see it looks almost happy doesn't it about the kind of cleaning that's going on except when they go deep into the air then the kudu doesn't really like it too much you'll find then it will kind of shake it off and try to get them out of those ears and talking about those ears kudus really do have big ears in relation to the size of their head we often see a lot of animals out here and, and each animal will have a different type of sense that will allow it to survive out here and so kudus because of where they generally like to hang around they like to be in the thick dense areas where there's lots of trees they need their to detect predators more than they need anything else and so really big ears to be able to help them hear what's going on around them and to make sure that they stay safe out here when there's lots of lions and leopards and things that like to eat them so it's a very clever thing to have a big ear it also helps a little bit with losing heat the bigger the ear the more that the heat can be given off through the wind blowing over that ear and cooling the blood and so it just helps to manage the heat a little bit as well now what's interesting is it looks like this kudu all the, the two kudu on the left hand side that you can see the two females they both look like they're pregnant there actually is a little male that's coming now as well but the one closest to us right there's the male at the moment between the two females and so that one on the right hand side and the one closest to us are both look like they have little babies inside and so generally we find with the antelope species is that they will give birth to their babies in the summer months here in south africa and now summer is not like the summer in the northern hemisphere over june july and that time our summer is actually november december january february and so they will be giving birth around those months and that's because when that ha when our summer Summer comes all the rain comes and that means this whole area gets green and the trees all get leaves you can see at the moment the trees are completely lacking in leaves they don't have any sign of greenery and it's very difficult for the animals and so they wouldn't want to have a baby now where the animals or the baby struggles to find food it's better to have the babies during times where there's lots of vegetation because then those babies can find food and also they can hide a lot better away from predators so you'll find that most of our antelope uh, our hoofed animals like the kudu and, and all the others out here will probably be pregnant at this time or have little babies inside them and they'll be giving birth from about November is normally when we start to see it all the way through until about March is April is when we last see the last ones of these kind of antelopes so it should be a good kind of time ahead both prey and predators will eagerly await the rains that come because the predators often know that when rains are arrive it's right time of this year when they start to have babies and and much easier for them to hunt the babies than it is these big adults and you can see the little male at the moment his horns are still tiny if that, if you can believe it uh, kudus have probably one of the most incredible sets of horns out of any of the antelope that we get out here horns that start to kind of come out like this male here and then they start to twist and turn and they can get as big as six foot uh, off of that kudu's head which is very 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 big it's about the same size as what i am and funny enough you can actually use a kudu's horns to age them so here we go I'll show you now a one of our viewers who watches the show regularly project alpha he's put together a really nice sort of chart on kudus and their ages now I do apologize if you can't see very nicely but basically you can see the horns on these kudus and it tells you roughly how old they are so the kudu that we're looking at is probably fits into this category which is about 15 months old so he's probably around that age and then as you see look as they get older so the horns start to curl and move and then eventually they get right down to the bottom when they're over seven years look at how impressive those horns are absolutely amazing set of horns so the kudu really is a very 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 beautiful animal as a big adult male so you know this guy's still got a long way to go it's why he's still with the females if he was a big dominant male you would have found that he would be mating with them and then he would move off and hang around on his own it's only when he's still young like this does he hang around with his mother and once his mother has her next calf then he'll probably be pushed out and start to then go off on his own and he'll have to then start to grow and develop his horns until he's big and strong enough to actually start start mating with the other with the females and also challenge the other males and normally with the kudu male that's anywhere from about five, three and a half to five years old until they're able to get a girlfriend good now Taylor seems to be in a birding mood this afternoon and she's found probably one of the most beautiful birds that we get to see out here
Tristan, I don't know if I have any choice but to do birds this afternoon, but we have found a very pretty bird. And it, it is, uh, what bird is it? It's a virtual starling, that's what it is. I was testing myself. Now it's sitting up in that tree, trying to keep out of the, the hot African sun. And it's telling all sorts of stories today. Let's listen to it. No, of course it's not going to say anything. See? It's the storyteller today, as it also cleans its feathers. Now, it's very important that this bird keeps its feathers nice and clean, because if it doesn't, it's not going to be able to fly as well. And they can get quite dirty throughout the day, so all those feathers have got these tiny little hooks on them. And I wish I had a feather to demonstrate, but I don't. But those hooks come undone, and when that bird rubs, runs its beak along the feathers... <coughs> excuse me. A bird was not impressed with my version of his story. He runs his, he runs his beak through the feathers, and then all those little hooks line up again, and then it's fine. And then they can fly, and then it's all nice and neat. <coughs> excuse me, everybody. Sorry. I've got the sneezes. Yes, many, many sneezes today. But it is just there. It's, I wonder where its friends are. Normally you see these birds in groups. I think it's lost. Or well, this one just doesn't have any friends. It's going to have to work a little bit harder if it wants to find some other bird friends. Maybe that's why he's shouting. He's calling for his friends. Hey, Bob! Bethany! Where are you? I'm here. Who knows? It's been quite windy. Ah, oh. hello Lily. Now, you've said that the last of the swallows have left, did you say south of England or New England? I didn't quite hear that, Louise. Sorry, I'm going, my ears are very blah. Southeast England, and you said that they're coming to visit us. Well, thank you, Lily. Some of the swallows have indeed started to arrive, but I'll keep an eye out for any more newcomers. Now you can see, look how beautiful the feathers are. Look at all those different colors blues and pinks and there even looks like there's a little bit of gold on this bird today with the way that the light is working those feathers and they're beautiful they're very very pretty birds now that is called iridescence they have on their feathers so depending where they are there'll be different colors in the sun normally they're a beautiful bluish and they do have a lot of purple on them but you know what i saw a little bit earlier and that's where we're headed to now i promise i'm not just going to show you all birds the entire afternoon because i saw an elephant a little while ago so we're going to try and find that elephant we're going to head down that in that direction direction now tristan i know is looking for a leopard by the name of hosanna and because it's been a hot day i think it's good that he's checking all the watering holes well i am looking in case Hosanna is around. So Hosanna is a young male leopard that we see quite a lot. I'm sure maybe some of you have even seen him before um, on our show. And so he was south of our boundary this morning and he was on a impala kill that was almost finished. And so normally when a leopard finishes its meal, it will make its way to a water point to come and have a drink. Now it might be a little early in the day for that. He might only come this evening when it cools down a little bit and then make his way here. So it doesn't seem like he's here at the moment. But what you can see is that this water is really starting to dry up. We are desperately in need of some proper rain we've had a few years of very bad rains that have caused a bad drought and so we've got really not much water around at all and it's making it difficult for the animals because the animals require a lot of water and, and you can see there how the mud is drying up in this little dam if we don't get proper rain within the next probably week or two we're not going to have any water left here at all oh, there's a little butterfly that's getting some of the nutrients from the mud so you will find butterflies will come out and feed off the edges of drying water they will find all kinds of minerals and salts that are stuck on the mud itself and they actually then will drink from there and 
kind of absorb some of those minerals that are otherwise quite tricky for them to get. You can also see there's a lot of algae in that water. So it's not the freshest of water and not water really that the animals want to drink. But when you're desperate and there's no other water around, they will. Now that algae is developed because a lot of animals have come here to drink and they've then gone to the toilet in the water. So they've dropped their dung, particularly things like elephant, buffalo and hippos and those animals then mean that that dung starts to break down and algae as the, the, the area shrinks and no fresh water comes in starts to populate and it causes that kind of green thick scum to form around the edges so not ideal for animals to drink here at the, um, anymore in fact if it gets too bad sometimes that algae can even potentially poison the water and make it dangerous for animals to drink but nothing here at the moment it seems as though everything is kind of just taking it easy in the shade still it's still a warm part of the day and so we're gonna try and just check around I'm gonna go past roughly where our leopard was and maybe we get lucky and we can actually see a glimpse of him somewhere I think though given he's going to have a big full tummy is that he's probably going to be quite sleepy and he's going to be under a shady tree somewhere having a really good nap because you know, when a leopard is full and, and there's no reason to move after a kill, then he'll wait rather until it gets a little bit cooler and darker before he decides to move around. So I don't think we're going to see our male leopard just yet, maybe a little bit later as that sun starts to come down a little bit and the wind starts to cool the day, then we might get lucky and have a look. It's important though when driving to these areas just to stop and check at each of the pathways because sometimes you'll find tracks for a leopard moving around and actually funny enough this morning what's that there's a truck there that i didn't see this morning so let's just double check here there's pathways that run to this water hole that sometimes will have tracks on them no that's not a track that we are looking for it was just a couple impalas stood in a funny way and it made it look almost like a paw but it's just impala tracks which is a type of antelope that we get out here no nothing there and I was saying earlier that actually this morning there was tracks for a male lion here so it's gone so sorry Louise can you just repeat the name there for me please Ah, Beck, yes, no, that water is not suitable for Hosanna. Hosanna needs much better water than that. Now, I was saying earlier that we did have lion tracks here this morning. Unfortunately, this lion went very, very far away, way beyond where we can actually go and see him. But yet, his tracks are around, and so I will show you them quickly. You can just see them on the right side of the road here, coming up and along that pathway. So he went towards the water. There is his track there. You can see he's got a very kind of deep back lobe area. So on the left side of that picture is where the back lobes are. That's the kind of back of his foot. And then his toes are on the front side. Now, the track itself looks quite nice because it's smooth and the sand around it is all pitted with rain. But that rain was about two days ago, so you can't read too much into that. And so we know that that track was probably from last night early last night because when I followed the track it was actually tracks for little um, nighttime creatures on top of it so you know if you see something like a genet or a civet track on top of a lion track you know it's early in the night that they walked but what I'm going to do is show you a better picture uh, on a book so that you can actually see what we're really talking about and how we tell the difference between a male and a female now if you look here this top track here is a female now these are very small tracks for a lion obviously not real size tracks a real size lion track would be as you saw on the ground very very big but these are the three lobes that I'm talking about over here you also see that their toes are quite spread apart very big oval shaped toes and you see no claws that mark on the front so a nice clean track but when you get a female lion it has a very rounded edge a female lion has this kind of line that comes up and the track down here comes up and if you take a line from the edge of that track and you come across and a line from the bottom here and you come across it makes a cross there whereas if you come to a male line track which is the one lower down you'll see that on the edges if you follow the the line around it actually forms a nice neat circle on the edges of those tracks and so that's how you can tell a male and a female apart also the male's toes generally are a lot bigger and the actual size of the track is much larger in a male than it is in a female but a really nice example of kind of tracks and so 
this poor lion, unfortunately, like I say, he walked a long way last night. I don't know where he was off to. But anyway, we're going to carry on. We're going to try to see maybe our leopard did come this way. While we check, let's send you across to Taylor with one of the tallest animals in Africa. Look at what we've got. It is a beautiful giraffe just hiding behind all the trees this afternoon. But that's what giraffes like to do is because they like to eat leaves. So it makes sense that he's moving around trying to find as many, many leaves as he can because there aren't very many tasty ones around at the moment. In the next few weeks, there's going to be lots of new green leaves and all the animals that eat leaves, we call them browsers, will be very, very, very happy. But how cool is that that he's using his tongue? He's been, look at it, stretching it all the way up. Looks like he is trying to eat some new leaves that were starting to grow on that tree. Although they don't stand a chance against that giraffe, he'll eat them all up. Now the reason that I can tell that he is a boy is if you look very carefully, hopefully he'll... No, no, he's being rude, now he's hiding away. We'll see if he turns to the left a little bit. Let me go back. Oh no! Oh, I think he's come out into the open now. Oh, there we go. So you just got to be a little bit patient. See those things on top of his head? Those aren't horns. Those are called Aussie cones. And uh, the girls have got long black tufts of hair on the tops of their Aussie cones, where the boys, they're clean shaven. So you can see it's almost like they're bald just on the top. So and that's an easy way to tell the difference. And the boys get much bigger than the girls. They get much bigger necks. They weigh more. And they are also taller, a little bit taller than the girls too. Doesn't look like he's even eating anything, but he is. He's just eating a few leaves. Now, I bet that every single one of you would be able to walk underneath a giraffe's belly without even touching. I think I could also probably walk underneath its legs and not have any problem. But banging my head, I don't even think I'd have to do the limbo. Underneath that giraffe, you can't see how tall he is now because he's very camouflaged in there. And all the animals out here have some kind of camouflage. And it's important for their survival. So I kind of like the fact that the giraffe actually look like trees. And he's just nibbling away. We might even see him a bit later. He might go for a drink of water. Parsix, Parsix, I can't say her name. Louise, please. Parsix. Parsix? Parsix. Oh, Car. Carsick. Carsick. There we go. No, we heard, I heard something else. So there were quite a few recently just narrowed it down. But the two types of giraffe that you can see on Safari Live or while watching us is this one, which is the southern giraffe. And then. If we were, unfortunately, we're not out in Kenya today, but if we were, you'd also see the Maasai giraffe. And the Maasai giraffe is the biggest of all the giraffe species, which is pretty, pretty cool. But um, the, the southern giraffe is, is the most common giraffe throughout Africa. They've got the, the widest distribution, so you see them in lots and lots of different places. So most of the time, if you're going to see one, you'll see one of these guys. And the girls are not quite as dark as the boys, but that goes for all the giraffes, all the different types of giraffes. We're going to carry on because it's getting difficult to see him now. Oh, I've got a paintbrush in my hand because I was cleaning. Look, how cool is that? Very nice. Get rid of all the dust. Okay, let me put my paintbrush back. Okay, we haven't forgotten though. We're still looking for our elephant, so that's where we're going to go now is focus our search on finding a big grey giant. Tristan is going to an even bigger watering hole. I am heading to a bigger one. That one that we were at now is just a dire, dire situation. There's really not much going on there and it's about to dry up. So we're going to head to the biggest water hole that we have in the entire Sabi Sands Game Reserve, which is where we are. And so we're going to try and see if anything is happening there. Given that it's nice and warm, I would expect 
that there might be some things that are lurking around. I definitely reckon we'll find some hippos. Maybe we'll get lucky with a crocodile and maybe anything else like eddies or some other animals coming to drink. Unfortunately, it doesn't look like our leopard has come back our side yet. He still seems to be on the other side of the road and kind of southwards, so on this side, which is where we can't go. And so we're going to have to wait for him to decide to wander over, which I would hope would be this evening. Late this evening, you might find he decides he's going to try and walk when it just gets a little bit on the cooler side. So we have a bit of a long road ahead of us. We've got to drive straight down this very, very straight road. And we've got to head towards the driveway and then turn down. Now, what is the temperature here at the moment? I think it is 26 degrees Celsius. Am I right, Louise? I think I remember 26 degrees Celsius, which would be about... No, 29, that's right. 29 and 85 Fahrenheit. Thank you, Louise. So Louise helps us out with our weather because us guides, we get a little bit confused about these things. So I knew it had a kind of six-like figure in there. It just was an upside-down six. Now, before we actually head on to this waterhole, sorry, I just want to check here quickly. This morning, I had a very, very brief view of a very special animal called a genet that was living in its home. And we call this genet Janet Jackson after a famous singer and so we're going to try and see if Janet Jackson is going to give us a view today there isn't a Janet just yet but what I can see is on the sort of V of the tree Craig can you see there's a lizard there that is going up the tree so go straight in Craig there we go you see the little lizard on the edge of the bark on the left hand side of the tree on the right side of that left stump if that makes any sense so straight in the middle there Craig there it is there is our a little skink by the looks of things uh, yes a side striped skink that is going up and is probably going to try and get into that hole you'll find that the reptiles today will actually be quite active a lot of them will be out and about and trying to get some sunshine where they can then get their blood warm and then they can start going and looking for food and a skink of this size would be looking for all kinds of little insects that might be on this dead tree so ants um, would be probably one of the the targets but it would have to be very careful because the animal that I was talking about the genet that is living inside here in this tree will eat that little skink very quickly if the skink goes too close and so it'll have to be a little careful that skink don't go inside the tree because otherwise you're going to get eaten you must stay on the outside Yes, it's listening to us at the moment. So just below where the skink is sitting, there's a little hole in the tree. And that's where Janet Jackson actually lives. Now, Monique, you say cute little skink. It is a cute little lizard, isn't it? Very, very common out here. We see lots and lots and lots of them. They tend to hang around all over the place. And they like to live around there. And you'll find them also in any sort of dead trees. They like to kind of lie in between the bark and the dead tree and, and try and kind of just hide out for the most part and then hunt insects but particularly anywhere where there's a camp you'll find a lot of them they go to the light sources and try and actually kind of find elements of food around light but there it goes up it goes actually I'm just trying to see if there's any food sources that we can potentially actually see on the tree itself doesn't look like it though does it no Right, no, nothing here. I'm going to have a quick little look here for two seconds if the genet is home because you have to get a little bit alongside it. So it'll take us two seconds to see if genet is going to give us a view. Normally on this lowest little hole over there, no. So no sign of our genet today. And so because there's no sign of the genet, I'm going to send you across to Taylor who managed to find what she was looking for. We did. How cool is that? We thought we weren't going to find him because he was walking in all the bushes. And we don't go chasing after elephants off-road. We stay on the road. And I'm wondering where he's going. Are you going to go to the pan? Hopefully he will. So this is a beautiful elephant bull. I say he's a boy. And I'm trying to think. It does look like he's been in the water, but maybe he was in the water a little bit earlier today. I think that could be the case because he looks a little bit dark around his head. You see his trunk and just below his eyes are a completely different color. So I think he was maybe in the water. Maybe he's come from the big dam that Tristan's going to. And that's like the only dam that the animals can swim in at the moment. But he's also looking for something to eat just like that giraffe. 
But elephants don't just eat leaves, unlike the giraffe, they eat a bit of everything. They eat all different types of plants. And what he's doing now is actually even eating the small They eat fruit, they eat leaves, they eat grass, they eat lots and lots of different things. Maxie, will you and I have got a thing in common? Elephants are also my favorite animal. I do enjoy watching them and whenever I get the opportunity uh, to sit and enjoy the presence of an elephant, I will spend as much time as I can. So now he's just eating small kind of sticks at the moment. So that's not really going to be too delicious. Now, the reason why elephants have to also eat so much, can you imagine, to get to that size, you have to eat lots of food all day long. Um, they don't have a very, very good digestive system. They only digest about 5% of their food. So, not 5%, 40% of their food, and they have to eat 5% of their body weight every single day. So for this elephant over here, he's probably eating about anywhere between... I don't know, 350 and 500 pounds of food every single day. And when there's not a lot of leaves and grass around, it's a lot of twigs that you got to eat. That's crazy. I don't think I'd like to eat sticks, for well, that many sticks. And what I really am hoping that he's going to do, is because it is so hot, is that he's going to move a little bit further to the west. And in the west is a small pan with lovely fresh water that he can drink from. And he might even splash some over his body. And that's one of the most amazing things to watch is uh, to watch elephants have a bath. And if the water is deep enough, and Tristan might be able to show you today, elephants swimming if there is a herd that does come down. But we'll have to see, won't we? Monique, I agree with you. Elephants do have a very calming sort of aura about them they're so relaxing most of the time sometimes you can get an elephant that's a little and, and then they'll just tell you that they're unhappy with you and then well you've just got to respect them and move away because most of the time they are very very chilled like this and don't even care i'm hoping he'll come right up to us sometimes the elephant bulls can be quite curious and he is slowly feeding in this direction but who knows how long he'll stand there for. He could stand there and decide he's going to eat that whole plant if he wanted to. That's why the plants have also got to be able to protect themselves. They sometimes have chemicals in them that make the leaves and things don't taste nice, and sometimes they've got thorns and spines. Maxie, I also wonder how old he is. Unfortunately, I couldn't tell you how old this elephant bull is. And the reason for that is because he doesn't have a birth certificate. He didn't tell us. And I can't see it written anywhere on him, so I can guess how old he is. I would say he is an elephant that is between 30 and 35 years old, somewhere around there. So he's big, but he's not enormous just yet. There will be some other elephants out there that are even bigger and stronger than he is. So he's actually still got some growing to do. See, now he's breaking off some big... Let's see what he does. No, he didn't like that one. He broke it and then he didn't even eat it. That's mean. But all the other elephants have already been feeding on those trees. That's why they're broken like that. There are not many trees or animals out here that can push trees over. But a big old elephant can do that with absolute ease. Now Tristan is doing a little Saturday afternoon bumble. He's taking his time to get down to the watering hole. Maybe he's got some news and he's going to wait for the elephants to get there. Well, no, not that. I am taking my time a little bit. I've been searching very carefully just to make sure nothing has been creeping around during the day that we miss the signs of their footprints. But what we have found is two baby waterbuck that are busy walking. And I think that these two are heading towards the dam that we're going to because they're walking in the same direction as we're traveling. And if they cross this road, or there goes a little diker in the background, so you saw another little antelope that ran across. That's called a diker, which is one of our small antelopes. And these little waterbuck 
should be heading, like I say, towards the water itself. So I think if we just wait and be patient, we'll be able to see them down at the water point. I'm worried as to why there's no adults with them. Maybe the adults are just further ahead. Now, there is a third antelope here that is quite tricky to see. But, Craig, do you see this from big marula on our right-hand side with the leaves on it? Just to the bottom right of that marula, there is actually a little antelope that is moving around in there. And can you see its ears just on the left side of the... There it is. Just on the left side of the tree itself. So that is called a little steenbok. And that is that we see in this particular area. It's not the smallest antelope in the Kruger Park, but the smallest antelope around these parts. And that is a fully grown big male. So he's a daddy antelope and he's still tiny in comparison to the rest. He's very, very, very small. But you also notice big ears, little sharp horns that they'll use to fight one another in order to establish territory and to be able to get themselves females. And you'll find that they like to walk around in these little grassy areas where they can camouflage very, very well. And I'm pretty sure that this guy is trying to find some shade just to try and rest in. It's so hot out here that I doubt he wants to kind of get out of the, the shade and really doesn't want to move too far. Interesting though that this particular animal, these little steenbok, they probably are the best animals for dry periods. Whereas the waterbuck in the background, as you see it disappearing on the top right of your screen, those waterbuck there, they're not in any way good with dry conditions. They need water to survive, as the name suggests. They need to be close to water in order to use it to evade predators. But also, they require a fair amount of water every day. Whereas the little steenbok that we saw, that little one doesn't even actually have to go to water. It will get its water content from the grass. So in the mornings when it's a little bit cooler, sometimes there'll be a little bit of moisture that develops on the grass itself. Dew off the grass, and that will be enough to keep this little antelope alive. And it's why you can find steenbok in even the driest places like a desert. That is just watching us at the moment. Now, there should be a female somewhere here. Generally, when you see a male, a female should be lurking in the same sort of area. They are animals that do form a bond, like a marriage, that they will stay together for life, unless, of course, something like a leopard or a cheetah comes along and takes one of them. Then, of course, they have to look for another partner. But otherwise, they do stay together for life, which is pretty cool. I'm going to try and see if I can get a little closer. Maybe we'll be able to get a better view. It seems like he's quite relaxed. He's kind of looking at us, but he might let us just get a little closer. There we go. Now you can see he's just kind of watching us from behind the tree. Yes, we see you. Very cool to see. Now he's not sure whether to run or to stay. You see, look at the nose. The nose is sniffing us, trying to see, are we a threat? Are we something that he needs to worry about? Once he's worked out whether or not we're a threat, he'll then kind of figure out what he's going to do and by the looks of it he's decided we are not a threat and is therefore going to just sit and groom himself and not worry too much at all very cool right from our smallest herbivore that we have out here back to Taylor with our largest so we've worked out that this is actually a very grumpy elephant I think it's because he's very hungry and he came over and he told us that he didn't like us being here, but it was very rude. So we just told him that we don't like that kind of behavior, and then he walked away. So now we're not talking to one just pretending that we're not even here at the moment. You can see he doesn't, he's not too keen on eating that brown, old, dry grass. He's like, I'd rather eat the twigs. Siddharth, yes, I do think the elephants have a hard time in the dry season, but the, I suppose they're kind of used to it, you know, especially the elephants that live up in this area. So in like the northeastern parts of South Africa where the winter times the, there's very little rain and most of the time virtually no rain. So everything kind of dies around it or at least goes dormant because a lot of the grasses are actually still alive. It's just their roots that are keeping them going underneath the ground. And uh, the top parts of the of the plants have basically just died. But as soon as some rain comes around, it will all be regenerated and will grow quite quickly. But luckily for the elephants, they've got some, um, sp I suppose, special adaptations that can help them make it through the dry season. So those tusks, those are really good for digging and for pushing over trees. Not just that, but also just their 
big strength in their strong trunks so they can they can dig for things underneath the ground from water to roots to bulbs and you can see what he's doing now is he's using his trunk which has also got very very tough tough skin thick skin and he's moving the thorn try and see if there's any nice green grass that's underneath those plants here how clever is that but I don't think he's winning today See, he's moving right on in there you can hear all that stuff being pulled around so he eats lots of different things and all the different plants out here have got different types of nutrients and proteins and carbohydrates and all those types of things so it's important that he has a varied diet he eats as a lot of different things but at different times of the year they'll eat different things too see look how strong he is clever hey he's picking that up and now he's moving it right out of the way so if he goes and he feeds along the drainage lines which he's going to now he might get lucky and find some jackalberry fruit which is so tasty and filled with sugar I think he'll be happy to have that extra energy otherwise there's not really much and then the knob thorns are starting to get their leaves and so are their marula trees Ali I don't think elephants are necessarily afraid especially the big elephants but they but they're careful so of course they'll be nervous of lions and leopards and wild dogs and hyenas so the carnivores they don't like them not that they are at risk especially a big fully grown elephant but their babies can can definitely be eaten by those predators so they'll try and chase them away they just don't like them around I've even seen uh, lions trying to catch a, a buffalo before and then an elephant came in and chased the lions away and saved the buffalo so they seem to try and help the an other animals when they can now he's moving into a place where we can't we don't I don't want to move around too much because I know he's gonna come out and he's gonna charge out of the bushes and tell us how angry he is but he's just moving all the thorn trees out of the way and he's still looking for the nice grass but he doesn't he he looks so upset with himself that he's put it in all that time and there hasn't actually been any grass that he's been able to eat I don't actually think there'll be much green grass hidden away we haven't had any rain so it'll be very very dry now it's more like straw mm, pushing through some small trees now I'm sure that's helping him and giving a bit of him a bit of a back scratch as well right Tristan has finally made it down to Chitwa Chitwa to the dam I'm sure you're going to see lots and lots of hippos Yes, lots and lots of hippos, Taylor. So we have, as far as I can see already, over 35 hippos in the dam at the moment, which is a lot, I know, because I've spent a lot of time in this particular area, and I've spent a lot of time at this particular dam, given that I used to work at this lodge, and so I used to be here every single day. So anything over 20 hippos for this particular sort of water hole is a lot, and I reckon there must be easily 40, because I can't see round the bend towards where there's another area, so... I reckon there's a good good healthy population and the reason why is simply because it's so dry there's really very little um, places for these hippos to go and so as the water shrinks in their normal area they then have to get out and start walking and trying spot to go and sit and to get out of the sun remember that a hippo is very much like us as people they do not have a lot of hair on their body they kind of got very little hair and that means that the sun is hugely damaging to them it's not good for them at all they unfortunately will suffer from sunburn and dehydration exactly like us as humans do so as we kind of sit in the sun we go pink and we burn and it's not very comfortable the same will happen with a hippo and that's why they try and find water during the day it's just to sink their body in keeps their their skin hydrated and it also allows them just to keep out of the sun a little bit more and so what you'll find with these hippos is the whole day will be like this at night though they're going to come out and they're going to begin to feed they're going to start looking for all kinds of grasses that they can feed on and actually if you look around the dam it's quite interesting if you look towards the sort of open area that the clearing 
the sort of left side of the dam, these hippos would have been out so much that they've actually grazed all the grass completely in this area. There's really very little grass. You can see it looks almost like a big sandy patch, and that's because the hippos have gone up and down and literally eaten everything that there is around here. So between them and a couple of the grazers like the waterbuck, they've kind of destroyed this area. Now what I can also see, I think, is a crocodile. Craig, do you see right on the edge of the water here? There looks like a little crocodile. Now, Kozada, when do we expect to see rain? Um, well, our rain should... there's our little crocodile. I think it's a crocodile. Is it a crocodile? Yes, it is a crocodile. And we should get rain. Hello, hippos. Let's see if any more talk. So that's them just having a little chat to themselves. Now, the rain should theoretically start coming in, we should get a, a decent rain normally in October we get a, a fairly good rain that just starts the growth process starts to get everything a little bit greener and um, the trees start to get their leaves but the majority of our rainfall lately in the last couple of years has fallen between sort of end of January and late um, April that's generally where we get most of our rain at the moment it used to be actually two different seasons we used to get a rain period in September October then it would be quite hot and dry and then it would kind of more rain would come January February March but it's changed a little bit it seems as though things have shifted slightly and so we get more rain towards the sort of beginning of the year rather than the end of the year and I can say that if we do not get good rains in the next month it's going to be a very trying time for a lot of animals because what's happening at the moment is the heat is starting to soar and the temperatures out here are going to get hotter and hotter and that means things like grass and leaves are going to get burnt by the sun because there's no moisture in them there's no water to rejuvenate those plants and that means that the animals really struggle to find good food on top of it we're also going to get lack of water for animals to drink and that makes it very tricky for the animals to survive and so we do need a good rain to try and kind of get everything sorted out it's vitally important for this ecosystem that we get rain and so hopefully this year will be a much better rain there you can see one of the hippos that is just turning around lots of egyptian geese in the background as well and they are always around Chitra Dam. They find themselves on the banks here and they'll kind of move around looking for bits of food that they can find along the shore of the dam itself. Now I wonder where that hippo is off to, maybe deeper water. It's decided it's had a good sleep and is now going to move deeper to go and cool off a little bit. Hippos really do have the best life when it's this hot weather that we get in the summer months because they can go into the nice cool water and stay nice and cool trying just to find some shade and I think they all agree with me at this stage I love that sound it's the best sound right so we're gonna sit with these guys a little bit longer let's see if any we should hopefully get some sort of signs of animals drinking and so while we do that let's send you back across to Taylor and her big pachyderm as he searches for food Well, we're waiting patiently because we're hoping that they're going to go down to one of the pans. But they're still a little way away, so it might take them some time to get down there. But I think it'll be worth it in the end because I think we could get splashed with water by the elephants. How does that sound, Darby? Don't you think it would be nice to have a pool party with some elephants? I think so. So this is another elephant that's arrived. I wonder if I put my foot on the clutch if we'll roll. Now Darby and I are doing the shake. Nope. We're going to have to start the car. <laughs> we tried to bounce the car around a little bit to see if we could get it to roll forward, but we couldn't. There we go. We'll have a look at him. So this is a much younger elephant than our grumpy friend, who is now further and further into the bushes. So they're all slowly starting to meet here now. And he's just gobbling away. He was doing the same thing as the other bull earlier. He was picking up all the thorny trees looking for nice grass. Tracy, you know, I reckon all the animals out here we have to be very, very careful with. Because at any one minute, they, I suppose they could become endangered. Um, elephants and rhinos have, of course, been fighting the battle against poaching for for hundreds and hundreds of years. So one minute it's the rhinos that are in, 
you know, under threat, and, and that's what the case is at the moment. And then the next minute, the rhino population stabilizes, and then it's the elephants that are under threat. And this is kind of cycle of them sort of swapping positions has been going on for a very, very long time. And uh, at the moment, the elephants are doing okay. There's actually quite a few elephants in this area. Some people have even said that they're starting to get too many elephants in the Greater Kruger National Park, which can become a problem. So, I mean, there's too many animals. Obviously, they all need to eat food, and if there's not enough food to sustain them, you'll kind of see what's happened at Chitwa Dam, for example, but you'll see that on a huge scale where there'll just be kind of nothing left. So the elephants are doing, they're doing all right, but we have to watch their, their populations. I mean, I'm sure there were hun probably hundreds and hundreds of thousands of elephants, maybe even millions that once roamed the earth. But unfortunately, we are nowhere near those numbers anymore. But the African elephant seems to be doing better than the rhinos are doing at the moment. So we just have to watch them and make sure we protect all the animals. Hmm. <laughs> Marshall, I'm so glad that we could have, where we helped you in making, or having the elephant, sorry, as your most favorite animal. They are amazing to watch. I th I'm overdue for a sighting with a breeding herd and lots of babies, so I'm hoping in the next little while we will be able to see that because I miss it so much. And the elephants of the Sabi Sand, too, are just so incredible. Look at that elephant's tail, swishing it around quite a bit, hey? There must be lots of biting flies around that it's having to use that as a fly swatter. Well, leopards and lions and cheetah, they all use their tails to help them balance, especially leopards and especially uh, the cheetah. Uh, elephants don't use their tails to balance though because they don't have to worry about trying to climb trees. And they've of course got four legs so that normally keeps them on the ground, but that does come in handy as a fly swatter. And we're lucky we can just flap our arms around and sometimes they even break a bit of a branch or some of these trees that you can see that have got the green leaves called guari leaves and uh, they make for a really really good fly swatter but i think that that elephant's tail will be a whole lot better they don't stand i just wish i could encourage them to go to the watering hole a bit quicker and just go and have a drink because I'm starting to get thirsty now. So I'm going to take a drink of water. Tristan is still at Chitwa Dam. And it seems as though a few hippos have popped their heads up. Yes, there are lots of hippos that have popped their heads up. There's heads all over the place at this stage. But I'm not sure why Taylor's jealous of a hippo. I mean, an elephant and its tail. Because, well, Taylor has a long ponytail that comes out of her cap and so she, if she swings her head from side to side she can use her hair to slap away flies and keep them away from her face and then she'll be far more comfortable so she just needs to nod her head from side to side and it will work. I've seen Taylor do it before and that ponytail is like a whip when she's upset with somebody she'll turn around and the ponytail will, will kind of flick around and then you know Taylor's in a bad mood with you and you've got to be careful. But anyway, our hippos are still kind of taking it easy. They, like I say, are very relaxed. They're not going to do much today. They're going to sit here and wait until such time as it gets much, much cooler and that sun sets. Once that sun is out, then they start to come out and feed. Now, we were talking earlier about that they'll use water kind of to keep themselves cool and away from the sun. They also will have a sort of secretion that comes out of their glands um, so they have a type of substance that comes out that's sort of kind of a reddish color it was all known as blood sweat for quite a long time and that will protect the, the layer or the skin of the hippo a lot as well and just protect them from sun as well as dehydration if they are also walking around when the sun is out. Maxine do they sleep in the water? Yes they do um, so it's quite interesting with hippos they can sleep and the body will naturally control buoyancy which is quite interesting so they'll be able to absorb but to breathe air and then they'll kind of go up and down and the body will automatically do it without the hippo consciously having to wake up and actually sort of try and breathe so they can sleep quite easily underwater most of these hippos are actually having a little sleep at the moment if you look at their eyes a lot of the time their eyes are actually closed 
that particular one his eyes is closing and then opening but for the most part their eyes will be closed and they will actually sleep just like that a lot of them also lying in a very shallow area it looks like deep water but it's quite shallow and they are all sitting at the moment so they'll sit and they'll find a little place where their head can rest and then they can also just sleep just like that you'll find sometimes the babies will sleep using the mothers as a or siblings as a little raft where they'll put their heads on and they'll kind of use the back of the other one as a way to keep their head above water so they can sleep very easily in water and they do they spend a large majority of their time kind of sleeping around these areas and so it is a well an easy thing for them to do and it makes sense you know if they are so susceptible to sun and dehydration it would make no sense if they have to come out on land to sleep during the course of the day or to have to stay awake for 12 or nothing um, it would really be an a incredible waste of time so it's good for them to be able to kind of utilize that time to sleep and then at night when they're out and the sun's away that they can actually go and feed and spend a vast majority of their time moving around rather than just sitting and sleeping because it's now kind of cooler so a much better system for a hippo a well kind of worked plan Paula at what age does a baby hippo become independent well you know it depends a lot of the time on on the sex of the hippo if, you know a little female hippo will stick around within the pod for quite a while and gets a lot more protection from the pod for a longer period of time but you must remember that hippos have a very short gestation short kind of calving period they will be producing a calf almost every year um, and so generally a baby hippo once it reaches about a year and a half it's pretty much self-sufficient it's able to feed on its own and it will stick close to mom in terms of the grouping but it's not no longer the mom's primary kind of um caring well the mom doesn't care for it as a primary individual it will kind of just be within the group and so after about a year and a half like i said two years they're generally starting to move around on their own accord and the female will then start to have her next little one which is pretty crazy so it's a very short turnaround much it's a very different thing to something like a rhino which is very similar size to a hippo a rhino has a double the length of gestation period and looks after their calf for a much longer period they'll look after their one for you know three four years before it will kind of have it's another kind of couple of years until it actually has one whereas hippos like i say there'll be eight where they'll have that baby they'll start to suckle it and within you know a few months after that it's starting to wean onto grass already and growing up and, and they grow quite quickly do little baby hippos and so they're pretty self-sufficient after a year and a half and do their own thing male hippos will stay within the, the grouping for a while until they start to look like they're a threat and then you're going to find that the, the big males are going to start to see them and kind of push them out a little bit and those males will then have to go and be nomadic for a while find their, find their own little pods that they can potentially dominate and look after so they have a bit of a tougher time than the females the females generally stick around within the same grouping and it's only if it really gets crowded for space will sometimes young females be chased out by others and find their own area also mating rights will push them to go and try and find maybe another male at some point but generally it's the males that distribute more than what the females do beautiful scene though isn't it all very relaxing at this stage of the day no one's really too sort of perturbed and too busy to move around you can see in the far corner there's a few antelope also coming to drink there's a hippo and one or two what looks like impalas drinking and some waterbuck down on the far side or those nyala those are nyala they are not impalas yes so the nyala is also having a bit of a drink on that side you can see how low the dam is it's very 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 low at the moment and it's not the lowest i've seen it but it is still incredibly dry for this time of the year. We should have had a bit of rain by now that should have filled this up. And so I'm really hoping this year, the rain, I'm really hoping all of our dams properly. It's quite incredible to me because if in 2012, if you have a look in front of me, there is a kind of slope that goes up to kind of stops up against and this slope that you see here, that's where the water was going over in 2012. So this whole dam flooded all the way up to the lodge and so that was where water was flowing and if you look at now where the water is it's pretty crazy to think how much water has been lost over the course of the last few years and the really small amount of rain that we've had quite sad actually so hopefully it'll be a good year of rain and it will get everything sorted now unfortunately 
It is around about that time where we're going to have to say goodbye to all of you fairly shortly. It's been a beautiful afternoon and we've seen lots of interesting herbivorous animals. Unfortunately, our cats did not come out to play this afternoon. I was hoping that we were going to find that leopard and that he would be sitting by a water point or even other animals around this water hole but that's the way it goes you never know what you're going to get on a safari sometimes you'll see lots of amazing things all action packed into one sort of short period other times you've got to drive around for a long period and try and actually find things and so it's still been a successful afternoon and hopefully that all of you have absolutely enjoyed spending time with Taylor and myself down here in South Africa and have really kind of enjoyed the afternoon that we've had I certainly have and so from Taylor and myself it's been an absolute pleasure we'll see you all same time same place next week for our kids safari